Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alexa Von Tobel, and this week, I'm excited for you to meet Greg Jackson, founder and CEO of Octopus Energy Group, the energy technology company with 5.1 million customers globally, operations in 14 countries, and a £6 billion portfolio of renewable energy assets. Greg launched Octopus Energy in 2016 to relentlessly use technology to unlock a customer-focused and affordable green energy revolution, and the company has grown to become the second largest energy supplier in the UK. Greg's vision has attracted over $1.5 billion worth of funding from international companies, large pension funds, and global investors, and has valued the company at around $5 billion. Octopus proprietary tech platform, Kraken, has now over 30 million customers worldwide and is licensed by some of the largest companies in the UK and abroad. Greg is a thought leader on issues related to energy transition, energy costs, and innovation. Greg built and sold a number of successful businesses before starting Octopus, including Consultant Connect, a telemedicine provider serving 40% of the UK doctors, and an e-commerce company, C360, which built platforms for many large enterprises. And with that, Let's welcome Greg. Let's dive in. First things first, in your own words, what is Octopus Energy? And walk us back to the early days in 2016 when you really had the aha moment to get it up and running. I guess Octopus Energy is a a tech-based company trying to build smart grids around the world so that we can make renewable energy cheaper for consumers. Uh, By doing so, uh, hopefully we can make the transition to a cleaner energy system, one that people support, that's good for them rather than one that they kind of feel slightly resistant to that's going to cost them more. Walk us through the experience of being an Octopus customer. What does that customer experience feel like? How is it different? Tell us that. Yeah, it's really funny, right? I mean, first of all, even before we think about the shift to renewables, what a terrible experience that maybe your second or third highest outgoing, your energy bills, is literally nothing more than a billing process that you pay. And yet, actually, there's so much more to it. So, I mean, the first thing is, In many countries around the world, the first thing you know about your energy cost is when you receive the bill. Uh, You weren't in control of it. You're a victim of it. So we try to make sure that people are always uh, aware of where they are in terms of energy costs. So whether it be through our app or the emails we send, the state of their account, how much they're spending is right there, front and center, in plain text. So you kind of know where you stand. But that's the beginning of empowering you. Uh, The next thing we do is find ways to help you spend less. Uh, For example, I don't know whether you know this, but an electric blanket uses 40 watts. A gas furnace or gas boiler uses 10,000 watts. So, you know, if there are times when gas bills are high, uh, snuggling up on the sofa with an electric blanket is a huge cost saver. It means that you don't have to choose between being warm and being worried. Uh, but then we go a lot further than that. You know, we use smart meters to run efficiency programs. It's sort of like a personal trainer for energy where we give you feedback. You know, you set your targets, we'll give you feedback on how you're doing. We use some artificial intelligence to adjust it for the weather, but it enables you to be far more in control. And, and then, you know, I don't know, for often in many, many places, getting in touch with an energy company is like phoning a, a government department. You know, you can spend <laughs> hours totally. waiting online, pressing buttons, Uh, It's just not friendly. Uh, You know, if you phone Octopus Energy, a very friendly, totally empowered person will be sitting behind a system that lets them answer any question. There's no calling you back. There's no putting you on hold. There's no waiting for you to go through another department. You started a company, but you had never worked in energy or climate. So this, where did the aha moment come from where you decided to go and dedicate your life to building a multi-billion dollar business, making the world cleaner and better? We think like customers, we are customers. And that helps us know what you can do to change a business for customers. I think part of this is I was frustrated as a customer at the terrible service I got from energy companies. They had out-of-date systems, which meant that they were always making mistakes or they couldn't provide help on the phone, they couldn't be flexible. And I'd worked in technology for a long time and been building tech platforms in lots of industries. And you could see the opportunity to use tech not only to drive down costs through operational efficiencies, but to provide these much better service experiences and and to put people back in control of this critically important part of their life. Uh, Alexa, I hope you don't mind me throwing one other thing, which is I joined Greenpeace when I was, uh, I think, 15 years old. I've always 
worried about what we do to our planet and what we do to each other. Uh, you know, one person's driving and is, a, is another person's pollution, you know? So finding ways to help solve that's always been important. And as we go try and build a world that runs on renewable energy, we can either make that a more expensive transition. If we try to make renewables behave like fossil fuels, it'll be incredibly expensive. It's a bit like when they invented cars and they had a guy walking in front of them to enforce a four mile an hour limit. You didn't get the benefit of the car. Now with renewables, at the times it's sunny and windy, we've got the cheapest power we've ever had and it gets cheaper every year because of the continued innovation. And we want, we want to make sure that citizens benefit from that. So we can use technology that says, you know, if you've got an electric car, we'll charge it at the times when energy's super cheap because it's abundant and green. And you know, if you've got an electric heat pump, we'll be able to shift the time around while keeping you warm to make the most of that. This all requires the technology. So it's just one of those great observations that technology could unlock cost and service and help tackle climate change. Talk about what you've learned about building a global company and what it means to enter a new country. In many sectors like energy, we think of every country as being different because the market structures are different or languages are different and regulations are different. But you know, underneath all of that, there are fundamental human truths. We all want to provide a better world for our family. And mostly around the world, people certainly care about climate change and want to do something about it if they can do that without excessive sacrifice. It turns out that physics is the same everywhere in the world. What we did was we built a company that was designed to be global from the beginning, that really spoke to the fundamental truths of humans and was built around the physics of the kind of energy we want to bring people, renewables. I think on top of that, we kind of um, wanted to uh, make sure we can make the biggest possible beneficial impact on the world. I think Steve Jobs talked about making a dent in the universe. And, and I guess we wanted to make a green dent from day one, kind of building something that was going to be ready to scale. But, but you know, what I've really learned is if we speak to those fundamentals, it does work everywhere. I've been blown away that when we opened in Japan, People said, you know, Western country companies going to Japan have got a track record of failure. But by being deeply rooted in what matters and then really sensitive to business and, and um, societal culture in Japan, we've been able to express ourselves in a way that works there, working with brilliant Japanese partners. And now our, our business in Japan is, I think, our second fastest growing in the world. Uh, by the way, we're present in 15 countries be able to build talent pools in you know, Australia and New Zealand and the USA and in Germany and France and Italy and Spain uh, and Japan and so many more has actually just made us a stronger, better business everywhere. Can you talk a little about your predictions from your unique vantage point? If you fast forward five or 10 years, what seems obvious to you? What are maybe some of the ones that we would not think about that we wouldn't know about that only you would know about because you're actually now a world expert on the topic? We are seeing the ravages of climate change right now. I was in New York a few weeks ago, and um, you know the smoke was thick in the air. I, I was speaking on the stage at uh, a conference about uh, the energy transition, and no one was talking about it. It, it felt like the movie Don't Look Up. Now, I, I do know, I understand this, right? Because when people are scared of something and they don't have a solution, our reaction as human beings is to put our head in the sand. But you know what? There is stuff we can do here. And the really good news is that the transition to, to clean energy is actually a cost saver, okay? Like a recent study by some um, academics at Stanford said that the transition to clean energy will cost globally $62 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money. Wow. But it will pay for itself in six years. Other academics have identified that, you know, the moment we start reducing our carbon emissions, it's only a few years for temperatures to start dropping. This is solvable. So when we look out there at the phenomenal power of nature as it tears wildfires across Canada and it dries up dust bowls in Africa and sea levels rise and glaciers melt, we have the power as a society to stop it quickly and it will be in our economic interests. The only thing holding us back is that governments around the world worry about the jobs in the oil industry that the oil companies worry about the returns to investors if they move to renewables. But you know, it is gonna happen. We will get there. So the only thing is every day we delay because of a lack of leadership is a day that we'll never get back. So 
given it's inevitable, let's grasp that. Let's grasp it now. When we go to renewables, our cities will smell the same as the countryside because we're not burning stuff. Uh, 10 million people a year die globally from particulate pollution emitted from burning stuff. You don't burn stuff in a renewable world. Look, there's a few sacrifices we'll have to make. Electricity will have prices that go up and down a bit more. But when it's cheap, it'll be the cheapest we've ever had. It's worth that price. You know, our team at Inspired has been studying the electrification of the grid. And, you know, you can very clearly see that there will be a marketplace where your car will actually be able to charge your home and excess energy you can give back to the grid and actually make money on your excess solar, et cetera. Talk a little bit about maybe some of those elements that you're excited about. So we already do all the things you just described for customers, right? Now, it varies by country depending on what grid mechanisms are in place, but none of this is the future. This is today. We have uh, it's about 50,000 customers who've got electric cars where we set the charging schedule differently for every car every day. And what we're saying is people who will fill their car up at work drive home and run their house on the electricity they've just taken from work, right? Now, these habits, I mean, these are, these are complete mindset shifters that we couldn't have imagined. But there's some really cool things. So sometimes the electricity price goes negative in many countries now, right? Because there are times when the wind's blowing, the sun's shining, got a lot of electricity on the grid. Traditional people in energy worry about that. They're like, who is going to build a wind farm if the price of electricity is negative? But try this. If you've got if you own a battery, a grid scale battery or car battery or a house battery, and you're filling it with negative priced electricity, you are literally getting paid to have an asset that later on in the day you can empty and get paid to empty. It's absolutely wonderful the world we can create. And so we've now got houses where we can tell a housing developer how much solar paneling, uh, what size heat pump, what size battery, what kind of water heater to put in. And if they do all that, when they build a house, first of all, it has no gas. But more importantly, we underwrite it. They will never have an energy bill. We guarantee five or 10 years of no energy bill. These people are being freed from the anxiety of energy bills. And their houses are generating more electricity than they use. They're great for the environment. And then this is the kind of huge win that is now available in the world that we are already building. Consumers love it shared a preview of a study by a management consulting firm that shows the net promoter score for Octopus customers is 39 points ahead of the industry average. This stuff is popular. It is insanely... Half of our customers with the right smart meters, hundreds of thousands, 700,000 customers this winter, would shift their energy consumption by an hour or two during peak times to save a bit of money. They save a, a, a couple of dollars per time they do it, which by the way is about a day's cost for electricity. So they're basically getting electricity for free that day in order that the grid don't have to turn on diesel power plants at peak times. So the environment wins, the consumer wins because they get paid. It turns out if you give people the opportunity to save money by saving the planet, they love it. What are the biggest things holding us back from getting to the vision you're talking about? You have a floor right now, everybody is listening to you. What can we all do and what's holding us back? So I think the single biggest thing is for 100 years, the job of grids and regulators around the world has been to ensure business as usual. All we wanted was an electricity system where you could turn the lights on and off and it worked. But over the next 10 years, we have to change everything because we need to move from a world where a grid is designed to take power from a small number of fossil fuel power stations to one which is designed that the energy to, uh, generate and distribute everywhere, you know, rooftop solar panels, wind farms near your house, solar farms outside the village, offshore wind farms, uh, electric cars that charge and discharge. It needs to be radically decentralized and it needs to go smart. Uh, there's one product we have that manages 50,000 electric cars, uses 2 billion data items per day to do that. We need grids that are capable of working with Massive amounts of data and machine learning. It's not hard, by the way. All the tech is here right now. But regulators and governments kind of need to get to understand it. And every day that they hold back, every day that they're consulting or analyzing is a day lost. So what we really want is grids and governments, uh, regulators, to allow in-market innovation so we can uh, iterate rapidly. And by the way, you know, the UK grid, after, after years of kind of thinking about stuff, 
really got on with it this winter because of the energy crisis. And it helped them say, let's just get on with it. And so they introduced like additional mechanisms, new pricing mechanisms, and the result has been lower energy costs, better efficiency and cleaner energy. So that's the number one thing we can do. I think the only other thing is to challenge the fossil fuel companies. And I, look, I'm not going to demonize them. We all use fossil fuels, you know. I fly in planes and currently they require fossil fuels. But I think we should be thinking of it like the tobacco industry, right? For a long time, the tobacco industry pretended it didn't cause cancer, just like the oil industry pretended it didn't cause climate change. The tobacco industry then talked about filters or low tar as though you could have healthy smoking. In fact, they said doctors recommend our brand, just like the fossil fuel industry will say, hey, look, uh, these fossil fuels are gateways to a cleaner world. Tobacco, actually, these days, right, for the people that want to smoke, they know the damage it causes. Uh, the industries don't have to lie about it in the same way. And they're generating, I think, for the last few decades, they've generated the best returns for investors. So this isn't about demonizing fossil fuels. It's allow about allowing them a path that delivers a return for their investors for as long as we need them, but doesn't delay the change to a clean fuel system. You recently shared an example of AI in the workplace where you experimented with AI in customer supported emails and found that it could essentially do the work of 250 people, but with better results. What have you learned? How are you using AI and pay it forward to everybody? What tips do you have? So when we saw chat GPT and other generative AI, I guess, towards the end of 2022, uh, we began a program. We, we asked some of our team, our data science team, start working it into Kraken. By the way, they were already on it because they were ahead of us. Uh, so they started that work in November. By January, they were trialing it in Japan, in February in New Zealand, and in March in the UK. In March, it answered about 1% of emails uh, that we sent to customers in uh, the UK. In April, it was 34%, and by May, it was 44%. So right now, ChatGPT, or a, a sort of something similar to it, is answering between 40 and 50% of all customer emails. And we send, I don't know, 300,000 customer emails a week, all personalized. And yeah, as you said, the, the incredible thing was that um, it generates a customer satisfaction rating of around 80%, whereas emails from a human generate around 60%. A couple more features. The first is, this is a tool to empower our team to do a better job for customers, to spend even more time helping the customers who need it most. Um, so it's doing the work of 250 people, but we haven't fired anyone because we're a growing business. We're using this additional time to do a better job to help customers, particularly through the, the stage of the energy crisis we're in today, to build out more renewable solutions, to help bring people solutions like heat pumps and solar panels. But the interesting uh, extra thing is I speak to someone from the world of AI, and he said, I imagine it's answering the easy questions. It's kind of like a chatbot running FAQs, but it's not. See, it's read every single training manual we've ever used with our team. It's read every blog, it's read every email, it's read millions of emails, it's read the transcripts of millions of phone calls. When it receives an email from a customer and reads it, it also checks the customer's account, their payment history, and their meter reading history. It provides an answer based on far more information than a human can normally do. So it's actually doing the complex work really well, empowering our team to give better service to customers, even in these tough times. Can you just tell us what in the energy space in general, what are you most excited about? Like when you look forward the next few years, what are the things that like you are in inspired and invigorated by? So in terms of what today, look, I think heat pumps. A heat pump turns one kilowatt of electricity into three or even four kilowatts of heat. The most you'll ever get by burning something, whether it be natural gas or hydrogen, would be one to one and, and you never achieve that. So uh, the opportunity for heat pumps to radically improve the warmth and comfort of homes whilst reducing the amount of energy we use and enabling it to be clean energy is, uh, you know, I think it's a real game changer. Now, heat pumps have been around for 70 years. I mean, it's basically the same in uh, technology as a refrigerator or a, an air conditioner in, in reverse. But I think what is magic now is being able to use smart technology to optimize them to work better with renewables and better with the homes people live in. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Okay, I want to transition a bit to you. You grew up in England. Was it clear to you when you were younger that you wanted to be a founder and an entrepreneur? I think it was, yeah. I mean, I was being irreverent. See, I don't like doing something just because I'm told. 
And I think often when you do something because you're told to do it, it might not actually be the best thing. Now, we've got one shot at life. And, and so for someone who, who wants to challenge whether or not things are the best things, you, know, you can't help but be an entrepreneur. If you think about something that your parents did that has actually contributed very positively to you being an entrepreneur, what was it? My mum uh, became a single mum when I was eight. My parents split. Uh, my sister was seven. My brother was a year old. We had no money. And she was trying to study. She worked in the evenings. She campaigned for politics and stuff she cared about, also in the evenings and at the weekends. This was a woman. For anyone who's a parent, it's busy. To do it as a single parent with three kids with no money, all that. she was a busy person. And one of the ways she made it work was um, there used to be a sort of bit of government support, uh, a few pounds a week that parents were given for their kids. And I remember I was like, and 11 years old, mum said, right, this is the money the government gave me, but I'm going to give it straight to you every week from here on. In fact, here's the book to go and collect it yourself. I'm not going to buy your school uniform anymore. I'm not going to buy your clothes. I'm not even going to do your washing. You do all that yourself. It was an empowering thing. Her ability to delegate to kids as they got old enough to do that basically meant you took responsibility. And what I did with the money, I, I didn't buy clothes. I learned to stitch my school uniform. So whenever it was torn, I just stitched it up. And I used all that money to go to the local electronics shop, buy bits of electronics, and tinker and make things. And then learned to write video games. And I remember selling them in a local shop and being given responsibility early on. And then choosing what you did with the resource, in this case, investing in stuff I was interested in rather than clothes, I think was uh, absolutely pivotal. Give us your what, what you've learned about yourself to be able to manage through the complexity and the stress. When you talk there about the things that get harder, I've never found decision making difficult because I never suffer regret. You know, you make the decisions based upon the best information you have at the time. And if they don't work out, you learn from it and move on. Yeah, you know, the simple rule is never making a decision that can cause unfixable harm. So, you know, never bet the company. But within that, being able to make decisions confidently, because I think you can usually make the most of almost any situation. So something works or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can build from there. You can only change tomorrow. So never any regret. And then I think the interesting thing though on, the, on a personal level, for me, that there are definitely defined moments in growth. For example, when you go beyond the number of people where you know them all by name, or when you grow to countries that you haven't yet visited, but then there's events as well that we have to absorb. And that's a really hard thing. Your team comes from tech, not the energy world. How has being an outsider, how has it been working in your favor? How has it been more helpful? Fundamentally, it let us create new workflows and processes, new ways of thinking about the product and the service from the ground up with no kind of incumbent thinking. We had to think about what the customer experience was when there hadn't been any from scratch, as opposed to this is the customer experience that you know, companies in our sector have always done, so how can we make it a bit better? And I think that means it is categorically different. And then I think um, being able to think about customers in sectors where people don't. So uh, one big challenge with the renewable transition is, is you know, I think it's a global word, uh, NIMBY. There's a lot of people say, look, I don't want renewables in my backyard. So we created products, for example, um, we've got something called the Fan Club. Where if you live near one of our wind turbines that's in the fan club, you get a real-time discount in electricity when it's windy. If it's pretty windy, you get 20% off. And if it's very windy, you get 50% off. It shows in your app, by the way, if you want to look. But basically, if you look out your window and you can see a turbine and the, and the blades are turning, you've got cheap power. That's a great time to fill your car or do your cooking or do your washing. And, and so what that does is it gives people a reason to want wind turbines never having had the sort of prejudice that people didn't want this stuff, which created a way that people do want it. And, and so thinking of the entirety of energy as a consumer sector, where tech can enable us to bring solutions to people, you're not tinkering with something, you're reinventing it. Greg, I'm going to transition a little bit to our quick fire round, where I'm going to ask you a question, first thing that comes to your mind, just spit it out. A book that has majorly impacted your life. There's a really cool book by, uh, called More With Less, by a guy called uh, Paul McCready. He was uh, a glider pilot, but as a brilliant engineer, he also created the world's first pedal-powered plane. It, it crossed the channel uh, from England to France. When he was building that plane, which, you know, it, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, required astonishing human effort. He looked around the world for the fittest cyclist to pedal it. 
And he found an Olympic cyclist, got them Tour de France, incredible guy, and then trained him to be fitter than you are when you're an Olympic cyclist so that he could pedal across the, the channel in a plane. And then on the night before the attempt, he said, okay, let's imagine you're a mile from the French coast and the plane is beginning to dip and you can't go on anymore. You've given it everything you've got. What do you do? And the pilot said, I give it some more. And I thought back to that conversation about the entrepreneurial thing. It's like when you have to find more and you've given it all, you can still find more. And, and that combined the efficiency, the, beauty, the elegance of the design with also the determination to make it work. And by the way, they did. And there was a point when they were just off the coast of France as they were finishing their flight and the waves just started touching the glider and he gave it more. If there's a question you like to ask when you're interviewing people, what is it? I always like to understand kind of where people see themselves in a few years' time. Like, where do you want to be? And, and one of the biggest things for me, by the way, is I think too often companies try to recruit people on the basis that they say, look, here's a, here's a job description and I want someone to do exactly this. And I want to find someone who can contribute something and then we'll build the job description around them. So it's stuff that helps me understand them rather than their ability to fit a predefined box. Biggest pinch me moment to date at Octopus Energy where you came home and were like, I cannot believe that that just happened. What was it? Early on when we started the company, I took the senior team away for an away day and in the evening, I let them relax by having movie night. What they didn't know, they were expecting movie night to be, I don't know, Terminator 2 or something, but actually it was Al Gore's movie, an inconvenient sequel. It was something very worthy. But within five minutes of starting it, everyone's WhatsApping each other saying, we've got to do more to tackle climate change. It was brilliant. So when Al Gore became an investor in our business, he joined a Zoom call. A, a thousand people lit up the comments panel. It was just unbelievable because it was kind of like a guy who's been fighting this stuff for 40 years Suddenly, it kind of put his faith in us. A quote you live by, a quote that really means something to you. So my mum that I mentioned earlier, she has a phrase which um, I, I think uh, is from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And I think there is something there that says like, those of us who have been given an opportunity to, for example, do something big and special. Now I do that. I do, I do that driven as a capitalist and entrepreneur, but I also do it because I think it can create a better outcome for society. And look, we, we have millions of customers be able to look after them and help them to the maximum extent we could because of where we are. It's been really important. And the same for our team. Many of them in their first job and then the pandemic hit and they're locked up in their bedroom, sometimes not able to see friends and family, sitting on the edge of a bed, talking to customers in distress. And again, to look after people like that at, at times of need, I think is really important. Greg, I love that. My absolute last question for today is, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned? The thing I've learned most as an entrepreneur is it really is all about the people. I think if you inherit a company as a CEO or as a senior manager, you can see people as an overhead. But when you build a company from nothing, every single thing you've got was built by members of your team. And so I think relentlessly understanding the ability of people you, you recruit to take responsibility to innovate and to build enables you to achieve far more than you ever could if you try and be excessively command and control about it. I love that. Greg, and with that, we are rooting for you, not only a little bit, a lot on every level. Everybody out there, if you want to check out more, if you aren't already using it, head to octopus.energy and you can join us next week for Inc. The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. Greg, you're incredible. I really can't just, like, I've been smiling this whole time. You're just a wonderful human being. Alex, honestly, thank you very much. But also, can I just say it's been one of the most enjoyable interviews, discussions I've ever had. I think the pace and positivity bring the best out of people.